My question is, when your mind is saying, go on, eat it anyway, go on, go on, go on, right, and we've disconnected ourselves from our mind, or we're going to try to in the future, aren't we, all of us? Yes, yes, yes. But when your mind's doing that, is it because you, evil chocolate maker, have put something in the chocolate that makes us crave it all the time? Yeah, it's compound 47, but we're not supposed to No, talk no, about no. It. <laughs> See, it's out, the secret. But is it just the sugar and the, all the other things? Because I don't know about you guys, but I mean, I'm, I, uh, my name's Amanda and I'm not ashamed to admit that from time to time I do have a craving. And do you guys have cravings too? I mean, I get them and seriously, I would do anything including pick my own eyeballs out with a fork to get to a choc top from time to time in my life. Is that, is that something that, that is a, a genuine legitimate craving for some compound in the, in, in the food? Well, chocolate does release... Um serotonins and things like that it's a lot of the um, pleasure chemicals in the brain it, it will satisfy but uh, there's nothing special added or anything like that it's just it tastes universally tastes good sweet most people like and um, there's enough fitness there if you have a higher cocoa content to satisfy the other half of the population and it just feels so nice it just because it melts at body temperature it just dissipates like nothing else so there's no chance that any food scientist might be trying to achieve the same thing with celery sticks or <laughs> carrots or, you know, no, maybe a, tomatoes. There's no thought. chance that I'm ever going to be wanting to run across the Sahara Desert to get to a carrot stick. No, <laughs> no. unfortunately. Damn it, damn it. Okay, do we have any questions? Yep. Here we come. Yes, I'm thinking about this absolute craving, which Amanda alluded to it, that there are times that I would have gone, uh, well, I have actually gone out at night to buy chocolate. A and, you know, I don't eat it all Show the time. Show of hands, who else has done that? Let's all be yeah. united in our grief. <laughs> yes. Okay, so I'm wondering, those little granules that we had didn't seem to me to be too bad. And I'm just wondering if they could be marketed with something where those of us who want our chocolate craving and have that, you know, does it have the serotonin and the whatever else in it without quite as many calories? <laughs> those little pieces, that what's known as cocoa nib, is about 53%, 54% um, fat. No. I don't <laughs> think you're going to get I a know, diet. All your hope then, all your hope just dissipated. That was hilarious. Bad luck. <laughs> so it's because of the muesli-like texture. It really is. But it's interesting because we were talking before about cravings and, and I don't want to marginalise certain uh, elements of the audience here, but I've been pregnant a number of times and I know that my craving for chocolate gets worse when I'm pregnant. And maybe, Robin, you can answer this. Is that me having some sort of physiological response that I need to get a Capri Cinema handmade choc top? Or is that there's some ingredient in it that my body actually needs? Or is that perhaps just my mind going, go on, you're pregnant, your ankles are swollen anyway, who cares? And by the way, you're creating a new life, you can have whatever you want. <laughs> I mean, that would be your mind, wouldn't it? Oh, well, some of those things you said <laughs> would probably be your mind. Um, but yeah, it can be a range of different things and... I'm not, a, I'm not a physiologist and I also haven't been pregnant, so I don't yeah. really... But it's that whole reward system, I think, that many of us get into with chocolate and get into us with food. You know, if we've had a big day at work, we come home, we go, well, I deserve something. I deserve something. I deserve a break. You know, and I think it's Mars, Mars have that strategy, you know, a Mars a day helps you work, rest and play. And there's another uh, chocolate company, I can't remember it is, uh, who it is. Obviously, it's not Hague's because they wouldn't do that to us. But, you know, where it's like, you know, you deserve this chocolate. And I think that that advertising must come into this as well, the way it's marketed, the way that we use our advertising campaigns. It looks very seductive and it is used in society and some parents use it as a reward system for their kids. Why not? Yeah, why not? <laughs> but, that, but that sort of plays into it too, though, Robin, doesn't it? That whole kind of, I've had a big day, I'll reward myself. Yeah, it can. And that's... And that's I mean, I guess why the advertising companies do that, because it does work, because yeah. we, um, we relate to those kind of statements and it does encourage us to, to act on those sort of thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else with any questions? Yep. Yeah. There we go. Reduce blood pressure. 
there are I some. I mean, that's why I don't have it. Of course, <laughs> of course it is. And, and, and it I'll tell you, without it, you'd be bouncing pressure. off the walls. You really would. Chocolate at night, and I have very low blood pressure. But do you have dark chocolate though? Yes. Okay. But do you have it with milk? No. Just, just, just straight up. Straight up with honey and water. Interesting. <laughs> there are compounds in. Um, there are. No, no, you're perfectly correct. There are compounds in dark chocolate, or in chocolate, but predominantly dark chocolate. You find most of it that um, dilate blood vessels, um, lower blood pressure, things like that. There's a lot of antioxidants in chocolate too. So, generally, a piece of chocolate or a bit of dark chocolate every day is good. Oh, it, yes, does. it does. It does. Many more. It gives you so many benefits. How much should you have, though? I mean, you know, a block is probably just, you know, you probably be, di you know, you don't want to lower your blood pressure too much. Well, do you? <laughs> you've seen, you must have seen that old uh, um, post around the place that a balanced diet is a chocolate on each hand. Yeah. <laughs> probably enough. Yeah, that's enough. It's interesting, though, Robin, what you were saying about the cravings and and I know myself that I've been like you know no you won't eat it you won't eat it yes you know don't eat it keep walking and you don't you don't want the chalk top you don't want the chalk top and you're right it becomes this giant monster that just takes over your life to the point where it is literally a battle between you and the monster and invariably it's you that loses <coughs> I've spoken to a number of people before dietitians people who work in in the health and fitness industry about exactly that approach and your approach too where it is in fact moderation and they say you know if you're going to have a piece of chocolate have the very best chocolate like if you get that craving and if you want that piece of chocolate or chocolate cake or red wine or whatever the hell it actually is give into it but make sure you get the best piece you possibly can and and just limit yourself to that and so effectively give into the craving but don't allow it to become so big and they all say that that's the key to a well-balanced diet that you can actually <coughs> maintain and these diets that we have gone on from time to time where you eat nothing but egg whites and cheese are really not sustainable for the rest of our life and we have to find a new approach would you agree with that yeah definitely and um, um, yeah that's what I was sort of saying in my future research I want to have a look at whether or not these approaches work long term because it is all about moderation it isn't about restricting. Restric restrained eating can often um, lead to more problems yeah. than eating foods in moderation. So it's it's one of the one of the main causes of obesity. Uh, so it's definitely not a, a strategy that I'd advocate, even though <laughs> even though I used it in my study for seven days. But um, yeah, obviously it is about lifestyle changes. It's about sustainable changes and um, not necessarily denying ourselves. Um, foods that we love. Yeah, absolutely. Now you had a question down there. Yep, get Just the microphone to you. Have you got any more chocolate, by the way, Brennan? Because I don't want to have to, uh, you know, avoid my cravings anymore. You know, Cough it up, toots. Took it out of your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. We've heard about the history of chocolate and Amanda and many of us have admitted to cravings. I'm just wondering if there's any anecdotal or other evidence that indicates that this is a 20th century problem or a 21st century problem. Is there anything that tells us about the history that related to cravings for chocolate? Not much, but there was a um, story about one of the, I think it was the Aztec or Mayan leaders who was um, <coughs> used to have something like 100 cups of chocolate a day. But I think he's also under the belief that it uh, enhanced his uh, prowess in the bedroom too. <laughs> But I suspect with 100 cups of chocolate, he wouldn't have been going anywhere near the bedroom. Oh, dear me. He wouldn't have been any fun at all, would he? He'd be going to the toilet all the time, but yes. anyway. Yes. Hang on, can we get a microphone? Yep. I would like to know... Talk into, right into the microphone. I'd like to know, uh, we've tasted the chocolate, it's bitter. How come it's so sweet? Do you use white sugar, brown sugar, do you put honey in it? What, how do you make it to be so sweet and smooth? Glass and a half of full cream dairy milk in every 200 gram block, madam. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> yeah. um, the cocoa liquor that you taste that was very bitter, that's the prime ingredient in any chocolate, dark milk or whatever. Well, we won't talk about white chocolate because it's not, but um, exactly. But um, the uh, milk chocolate has milk powder added to it. Both other forms of chocolate, the, the dark and milk, have sugar added. 
Um, when you look at a label nowadays and it says, say, 65% chocolate or 70% or 80% or whatever, that's just indicating the amount of cocoa mass in your chocolate, which is your cocoa liquor and cocoa butter. So the more of that there's in there, there's less room there is for any sugar, um, vanilla or um, lecithin. I, I lived in, um, in Asia for a while and we all used to know that if we went to the supermarket and we went to buy traditional forms of chocolate, so your picnic bars and your Mars and all those sorts of other you know, commercial brands, that we should never buy the chocolate that was actually manufactured in Asia. It had, because it had a completely different taste. It was not a nice taste at all. And if we were to buy it, we had to buy chocolate that had been manufactured in the Middle East. Is that because dairy products are not... Because obviously it's not the bean that's any different. No. Would it be the other things that are added to it that are not the same quality? Usually, yes. Depending on the local maker, where they get their um, cocoa liquor from would play a major part. But chocolate, even people big people like Cadbury's um, change the recipe slightly for whoever they're dealing with. The American stuff is generally sweeter than the English. The, um, I think the stuff in the Japanese market has a slightly salty flavour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, it's just market twitching basically, making it fit. Okay. Yes, non-chocolate eater at the front here. It's my understanding. It's my understanding that the uh, uh, cost of chocolate uh, at the bar in buying a chocolate bar is because of the um, um, uh, money that has to go to the processes uh, that are registered or um, um, I'm trying to think of the word proprietary um, processes or yes, something. Yes, yeah. uh, is that true? No, um, I understand that uh, a, a well-known chocolate bar, Mars, I think you said. Um, has in fact registered right through to people making cookies out of chocolate. Yeah, um, that's a, a product thing. Um, the manufacturer of chocolate, if you can get cheap labour and cheap electricity, you can make chocolate very reasonably easily. It's just, um, yeah, when manufacturing. When the food scientists are coming up with a new chocolate, like at Hague's for instance, I know last year there was a tremendous bar that was released uh, that's dark chocolate with cardamom. Has anyone tried that? Mm. Oh my god, cha life changing. Do you, uh, do you all get together all the food scientists and try and work out a pitch as to what sort of person you actually want to sell chocolate to? You know, because some chocolates are more masculine in nature mm -hmm. than females, than, you know, yeah. female chocolate. We, marketing look at that sort of stuff. We just yeah. look at the taste of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when we're pl playing around with product but reviews. But when you're working out the taste though, I mean, surely you're given some directive, considering that statistic was that more women, I think, eat chocolate than men. Surely you, you try and kind of get us a bit more sucked in. Mm -hmm. Are we more vulnerable as well, a look, consumer you just market? Say chocolate and hey? <laughs> you just have to say chocolate. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, I suppose. All right, yeah, that's a good point. We'll eat anything as long as it's got chocolate in it, yep. Uh, yeah, you just mentioned this before. Is white chocolate real chocolate? Technically speaking, no. There's no cocoa mass in it at all. Um, if it's a good white chocolate, they've used cocoa butter, and so it'll have some degree of um, cocoa product in there, but there's nothing of any flavour. So it's milk powder, sugar, lecithin, and um, cocoa butter. It's a confectionery. <coughs> Is that a bit strict? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was interested in how you produce different flavours. Um, similarly to perfumes, you have top notes, middle notes, bottom notes, and you create a different nature for each type of scent that you want. You as a taster and a food technologist, do you have the same sort of um, process that you go through when you're creating new flavours? And is that a response to a market um, uh, desire? Um, you'd, be, you'd be subject to the same mar market influences that all different products are. So that's h how do you actually create um, a good flavour versus one that's just a bit off? Um, we tend to do that critical tasting when we're tasting chocolates from elsewhere. So if we say have a, a really heavy morning and you know sort of 12 different chocolates um, from oh, places so around hard, the world it? <laughs> and you have to taste them and be quite critical about what flavours you're tasting and all the rest of it, it can be quite challenging. It, it, 
it's, it's almost reverse engineering in as much as you get the end product and you try and pull it apart and see what's in there, whatever. Um, when we're trying to de develop something, we tend to look, th we'll think of, okay, we want, we, we work with dark chocolate, what <coughs> can we try, what have we done, what have we got, what's, what's interesting, you know, so we've got a few things on the burner at the moment. Um, probably some of them won't come out for two or three years, but, you know, they're worth waiting for, they're interesting. You've got a question at the top there, yep. Oh, I just wanted to reject all the psychology and say um, I come where I come from, we believe in uh, everything in moderation, including moderation. <laughs> <laughs> when I walk down the supermarket and I see those snack chocolates, I'll buy a block oh. and eat the first row and eat the entire block and I don't care and it shows. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you leave the Turkish delight though. No one likes the Turkish delight in the snack. No one. Really? Yeah, oh, that's rare. <laughs> yep. Hang on, we'll get a, a microphone too. Robin, your diffusion uh, system, uh, first of all, I don't like the word very much. It sounds like too much diffusion, right? But what's the actual mechanism of that? It's obviously some sort of illusion, but what's the mechanism of the diffusion idea? Um, well, yeah, it's not, it's not my idea, I should acknowledge that. I didn't come up with the idea and I didn't come up with the label, but it's, it's based on quite a complex theory called relational frame theory and it's about language and it's just about um, how the language that goes on in our mind and, yeah, separating, separating us from language, noticing language more. Okay, so where do you find out about it? You can find it, it's called acceptance and commitment therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you Google that, there'll yeah there'd be a lot of resources available um and the two people well stephen hayes is probably um the main uh initiator of the approach mm -hmm. so he would be a good place to start as well and he's had a whole heap of researchers under him that have done research into the approach and looked at it in not only uh to do with weight but also to do with a whole heap of other problems. Yeah, that's what um, I was just going to ask. Yeah. I mean, has someone done it with heroin, for instance, and cocaine? People have, and people have done it with um, drug addiction, um, smoking. Alcohol. Um, not sure. Um, but uh, diabetes as well, so other health-related behaviour change. So it's, uh, it does have evidence behind it, yeah. um, but it's still relatively new in its, in its um, empirical research base. Yep. Uh, Rob, when you stated that 80% of our thoughts are negative, is that only in relation to cravings or is that in general? No, that's, that's in general. A yeah. losing battle. Thank you. God, I've just had negative thoughts then, thinking about my <laughs> negative thoughts. <laughs> that's terrible. Obviously, that's not, obviously, um, it, you know, not everybody is like that, but it's, it's a roundabout figure that most of us, um, 80 to 90 percent of what we think about and, and what our mind produces is negative and or unhelpful. Gee, that's shocking. We'll have to wrap it up very shortly. Yep. Oh, sorry. I just have one more question. Um, the idea of language is a really interesting one. Uh, when I ha hate to go back to this um, uh, Biggest Loser, which I was watching just a couple of days ago, and um, when they the trainers were trying to get these people to admit to their problem. Um, when they finally did, they said, I am overweight. Yes, I am fat. But in actual fact, those people are morbidly obese with very serious health problems, none of which was really talked about. And I think it, I found that quite strange, um, unless it's just not good television. And I'm just wondering what you think about that the way that language is, you know, people perhaps accepting um, when you talked about acceptance and commitment therapy. And the other aspect was when these people were eating, they actually weren't the most revolting things, I might add. We can all have pizza every now and again and the idea of enjoying the good things but not being enslaved by them. They weren't actually tasting their food. Yeah. They weren't really savouring or experiencing they were inhaling the they food. were just oh taking God. in and i was really interested how that was just unpacked by these highly experienced trainers who and it was really interesting that they were using this militaristic sort of you can do it and all this kind of stuff 
and yet certain things that should have been said weren't weren't really being said like you can't you're eating this but you're not tasting this and you actually have a much more serious problem than being fat sorry i'm going on a bit i'm just wondering what you think about this going back to the idea of language thank yeah, you yeah well i mean the the exercise i did at the end sort of um addresses the issue that you brought up uh with just inhaling food i guess rather than actually tasting it or enjoying it and i think um, we can certainly habituate to the amount of foods that we eat and um just get used to sort of eating things rather than actually eating and enjoying and tasting what we're eating. And I think in relation to your first point, um, there's some research that suggests that um, there's a different level of acceptance for different terminologies. So some people um, find, find it more difficult to be called obese than to be called fat. I think um, fat is more of an accepted term uh, and makes perhaps overweight people feel less um, less negative about themselves than if they are actually called obese or, or morbidly obese. So that may be a reason for it, but everybody conceptualises their um, world in a different way um, and we just use different terms to describe things and we just assume that what other people use, the terminology that other people use is how we use that same terminology when it's often a completely different thing. We're going to have to leave it there, ladies and gentlemen, but I'm sure you'll agree with me that tonight has been fascinating and very tasty indeed. So please can we thank, from Haig's Chocolate, Brendan Somerville. <laughs> and from the CSIRO, still can't believe she's a doctor because she looks so young, Dr Robin Vast.